At long last, we have come to the end of our study through the book of Exodus. This is our 31st message in Exodus, if I'm not mistaken. So that's, that's less than one per chapter. It's not a bad pace, I don't think. We've gone from the stories everybody knows, which is slavery in Egypt, the burning bush, the ten plagues, the Red Sea crossing, and that's about where the movies usually end. But then we followed them across the wilderness as God provided bread, as God provided water. He led them through their first battle against the Amalekites. They came to Mount Sinai. God revealed himself in glory, renewed the covenant with them, started giving the law to Moses, and then they promptly built a golden calf and started to worship that. But the Lord listened to the intercession of Moses, forgave their sins, and is now ready to move forward. And today, we're going to see the people will construct the tabernacle. This is the end of the book of Exodus. The final crisis is past, and from now on, we're, we're just seeing them build this thing. And it's a long section, and it can be tedious to read, but you need to grasp the gravity of what we're going to discuss. God intends to dwell among his people. He is going to be in their midst, not just in the heavens, not just in their hearts, but in their very midst. He's given Moses the blueprints for the tabernacle, and in 35 through 40, they're going to build and assemble the tabernacle. And that is the goal for all of us as disciples of the Son of God, is to have him dwell in our midst, to have him be with us. How many times in the Last Supper did Jesus say, I will not leave you, I'll be with you. I'll send my spirit to be with you. The book of Acts describes the presence of God with the people of God. In 1 Peter 2, 5, Referencing the construction of the tabernacle and the temple, which came later, Peter says, you yourselves, Christians, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. That word house can be translated tabernacle. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So the New Testament looks to the old covenant, the old tabernacle, as a picture of who we are in Christ. Makes all those pastors or Peter and elsewhere talk about the tent that we're living in, isn't it? When you know that a tent is what the tabernacle was. The Holy Spirit has come among us as the church. But as we know from 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it is possible to quench the Spirit. Meaning it is possible to be a believer, to be in church, to be doing a lot of religious things, and yet not have the presence of God dwelling among you. You can put out the fire of the Spirit by your life. So if we are to build a house in which God will dwell. And we can broaden this out. We're going to talk tonight about building a church where we want God to be, a family. We want God to be in our families, our businesses, our individual lives, our communities and nations. If we want to build a house where God will dwell, then let's take a look at the example of those who did it and received it. It's my favorite professor from college, Dr. Dave Early, used to say, if you want what they got, you got to do what they did. And we also have been saved into his covenant, a better, new covenant. So we ought to prize his presence as Christians and prepare ourselves to receive it, not just in the church and not just as individuals, but in every aspect of our lives. So there's going to be a lot of reading tonight, but that's okay. It's Bible. Every word is inspired and profitable. So let's take the time to go through. We'll start off nice and easy. Three verses. Exodus 35, 1 through 3. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. The last thing we saw was God renewing the covenant with Israel. Moses asked to see the glory of the Lord, remember? And then God said, I can't show you my face, but I'll show you my back. He hit him in the cleft of the rock. Moses saw the glory. God proclaimed his name. Wonderful story. Well, now Moses comes down. Remember, Moses' face was shining at this point. And the first thing he says when he calls the assembly is to keep the Sabbath day, which seems odd and a little out of place at first. When they're about to build the tabernacle, why is the first thing he says, keep the Sabbath day. It's important, but why? Well, you need to realize the work is about to begin. They're about to begin constructing the tabernacle. And God lets them know up front, you're going to do this holy work for me, but even in this work, you are to take a rest every seventh day. 
So you need to see this as overseeing the work that is about to take place. Because that's exactly what God did when he was building a house, isn't it? Genesis 2, 2 through 3. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So even in this most important construction project ever, they are to be holy and keep all of God's commandments along the way. Here's our first lesson for tonight. We're going to have four. To build a house for God, it must be done in the right spirit. God cares very much about how we do his work, does he not? God is not just concerned about whether it gets done, but how you do it. The process matters. The attitude matters. The way you talk to each other while it's being done matters. I can imagine that the Sabbath day would introduce complications, it would introduce delays, and would make the more go-getter of us to be a little frustrated sitting around while there lies that tabernacle and I got to finish doing that. Some of y'all are nodding at me. You know what I'm talking about. I'm the same way. We've, we'll take a break when the job's done, not when we want to break. If we finish at three, we have lunch at three. That's the way it goes. But God is coming in and saying, this work is more holy than that. It is more important that you do this work the right way than that it be finished on time or be done efficiently. In the same way, whatever house you are building, whether that's a church, your community, your life, your family, a business that you're building, your class in school where you want God to be present, if you're building a house, it's got to be done according to his will and his word. Let's look at some examples. When you build a church, you're saying we're going to Have this church be a place, a house for God to dwell. We want God's presence to be here. That's what we want here. We're just having meetings if God doesn't show up. Amen? Well, then what do we need to do? We've got to do it his way, in the right spirit. It's got to be done in love. You ever been to an unloving church before? It's like, we're doing a lot of religious, pious stuff, but as soon as it's over, we're backbiting and we're angry. Maybe you've served on a ministry team where you're doing something sacred and holy, like setting up chairs. It is holy if you're doing it in the spirit. And somebody's barking at you because you're doing it wrong. You're like, this, this is, seems a little much. Hey, we got to get this done. Well, yes, we do, but not that way. That's how the Lord sees it, right? It's got to be done in love. Let everything that you do be done in love. And prayer in the church. Very often we we don't have time to pray and do the spiritual things because we've got too much other stuff going on. But God goes, no, we don't skip prayer. The the apostles in Acts chapter 6 would not leave the ministry of prayer and the word in order to handle the widow's distribution. They gave it to somebody else who could. We prioritize those things in the church. What about your house, your family? You're trying to build a family. We want God to be in our midst. We want God to be first. We want him to bless us. We want him to guide us. Okay, then you better be kind to one another. Every member of the family is given instruction to be kind in the Bible. Children, honor your mother and father. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Fathers, or husbands, love your wives. Fathers, and mothers can be included here too, don't provoke your children to anger. Everything is conducted with love and respect. Sometimes we we get in the car to church and we're yelling and fighting because we can't find our shoes on the way here. And then we're, you know, getting mad at each other and getting bitter and petty. And then we get in the church door and we're like, oh, praise the Lord, brother. Good to see you. Hallelujah. And then we say, God bless our family. God goes, I want to bless your family. How about you start by being kind and then blessings will abound. And our community, we want our community, our nation. We talk about this all the time to be God's place. You know, whether we were a Christian nation is up for debate. I want us to be one in the future. I want us to be one now. I want this community to be one that serves the Lord. Well, if you're not going to do that with justice, then it's not going to happen. Read through the Old Testament prophets again. He's like, you're going to come to my temple and sacrifice, and then you're going to go home and rip somebody off and take their home from them? You're going to oppress the poor and then come and offer a sacrifice in my temple? Why would I hear that prayer? There must be justice in the land. There must be honesty. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. If you've been to a third world country or, or been around the world on missions, you know you can't trust anybody. You, you know, they might tell you what the price is. It may or may not be the price. The government official may or may not help you. The police might not be the ones you want to show up. If people are not going to be honest with each other, it won't function. But you can, you can shout revival all day long, but until you decide to start doing the works, 
not going to happen. Say, God, I want you to fill my life. Let my body be a tabernacle where you can fill. Good. Are you going to be humble? We talked about this on Palm Sunday. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself? You're going to turn the other cheek? You're going to not put yourself forward? Are you going to take the time to devote your life to the Lord? Or are you just going to say, Lord, bless this mess? Now, it might be a mess, and you might want the Lord to bless it. But the thing is, are you taking the time to honor God's commandments in your pursuits? Because if you don't, if you're not inviting God at every step, you just want to do it and then have God bless it, you need to read Psalm 127. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. The psalmist writes, if you think you're going to build something for yourself without inviting God, you're going to be spinning your wheels and exhausted. And it's not going to happen. You must build the house in holiness, following God's commandments, if you desire it to be a place where the presence of God may dwell. Well, let's go on now. Verse 4, longer section here. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skin and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastplate. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent, and its covering, its hooks and its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense with its poles, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering, with its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the court, and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women. All who were of a willing heart brought brooches, and earrings, and signet rings, and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands. And they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. And then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded." 
And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning, so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, the people, br- excuse me, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. We'll pause right there. So Moses puts out a call for contributions of all the materials they're going to need to build the tabernacle. Not just the the materials, but the labor as well. Bezalel and Aholiab will be in charge, but anybody else who knows how to sew, who knows how to cast metal, who knows how to carve wood, you can come and you can help. Notice here, no pressure was put upon the people to do this. They didn't go around with pledge cards trying to find out what everybody was going to give. They just said, bring as you feel led in your heart. It was, as it says, a free will offering. We'll learn about this more in Leviticus, but a free will offering is something that is not compulsory, like when you sinned and you had to bring a sin offering. It was just something you gave out of your own heart. So everybody helped. And there was more than enough given to the cause. Do you like how it said they had to be restrained from bringing things to the tabernacle? said, listen, guys, we've got enough. We don't need any more. There's way more than we can possibly use, and yet the people kept bringing it. They had to make an announcement. This is the example of how God desires people to give and to tithe in his church, by the way. Paul would say the same thing in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And this is a great example of cheerful giving, similar to how we see in the book of Acts that the church was selling their their property and their land and distributing the money to those who were poor in the church. You see here, the construction was to be a participatory activity. It was not just sit back and watch Bezalel do his thing. Everybody who can help should help. Whether that means you come in and you actually swing the hammer or you hold the chisel or you you thread the needle or whether you say, I don't know how to do any of that, but I can give you what I do have. You know, I I have some cloth that is that is red or scarlet. So, yeah, you can have that. Everybody helped. So this is our second lesson to build a house for God. You need the right stuff. And I'm kind of being a little silly. there. the right stuff because they actually did bring in the right stuff, didn't they? What do I mean by this? There's a cost to be paid. If you want to build a house for the Lord, if you want your life or your community to be a place where God's presence can dwell, it will cost you something, mark my words. If you're looking for a religion that doesn't ask anything of you, then go check out Buddhism because you're not, you're not in the right one. Don't actually check it out because it's not true. But you get the point I'm trying to make. Everybody must contribute toward that cost. Every participant in whatever house you're building must help shoulder that cost as much as they can. The tabernacle, as we read when God gave him the description, it would require gold and silver and bronze. It was going to require precious stones and oil and spices and a lot of acacia wood. Not to mention the long, long hours of work that it would take to actually build this thing. So this task needed the contributions of the entire congregation. There was a cost that needed to be paid, and everybody was expected to pull their own weight. Nobody was compelled, but they were expected to. And they found it a joy to do that. Likewise, if you want to encounter God, you're going to pay a price. You want to have God in your family or your heart or your church, it's going to cost you something. Jesus said that, right? If any man would come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You don't want to be like the guy that didn't count the cost. They started to build the building and they didn't do the budget. Now they don't have enough money for it. Or the guy that says, I can conquer this army with my small army and he didn't do any planning and now he's getting stuck. He says, don't do that with me. I'm telling you right now, it's going to cost everything you've got. I mean, look at building a church. We'll use these same examples as we go through. You're building a church. You got to have the right stuff. There is a lot of literal cost to run a church. I mean, we're sitting in this room. It was not like this very long ago. We needed carpet and we needed chairs, and I don't know that we needed any.
acacia wood, but you know, there's other things that you need. There's electric bills that need to be paid. Paul talks about those who labor and teach in the word ought to be compensated so that they can take the time to do it effectively. We have outreaches and missions that we want to do. We have things that we want to do for the kids here. We have events that we want to put on. It takes money. It takes effort. You know, sometimes we just want to give money and, and not put forth any effort. And then we end up kind of stuck. And sometimes we say, well, I'll help, but don't you dare lay a hand on my wallet. Well, nobody's doing that, but the Lord does remind us there's a cost. And there's work to be done. So you can't just show up to church and saying they'll put on a good show and I'll go home. No, you need to participate and engage. And that, if, if it's just a couple people doing the work and you say, God bless that. He says, this isn't a concert. You know, this isn't a TED talk that you're coming to. This is a family. It is a church. It's a the word church means congregation, ecclesia. So everybody has to contribute, not just financially, but that's part of it, but through their own labor, through your own spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about that. So often we sit on our spiritual gifts. I'll say especially, I'll just use one example. There are so many people I have found that, that speak in tongues and try to keep it quiet. Like the Lord said that all the gifts are necessary for the church to be built up. That everybody seems like, I ought to keep that to myself. They don't need that. It's, it's just for me. No, that's not how the Lord does it. There's a cost. Family requires work to function. Have you noticed? Have you found that even just being in a physical house requires a lot of work? Sometimes I feel like the house would just fall apart if you didn't give it constant maintenance. It's like, didn't they just build this thing? Why am I already doing work on it? But relationships are that way too. You've got to be constantly working and growing, especially as your kids grow up. The dynamics change. The dynamics of your parents change. And you've got to always be working and growing and pitching in. You ever have a family work day? You're out in the yard or something, and there's one sibling that's not helping? Yeah, it doesn't go very well, does it? For us, that's Josie May. She always tries to find one, one little thing that'll keep her busy but make her not actually work for a while. We cut down all this brush in our backyard, and everybody's helping haul it to the burn barrel or haul it to the dumpster, and she'll get, like, one stick and just kind of be twirling around with it. And, like, Josie, you got to go faster. I'm coming. I've got, look, I'm doing it. And, you know, we know she's just a little thing, but her brothers aren't quite so, so patient with it. Because everybody's got to chip in, not just with things like that, but, like, if you're going to make this marriage work, you both better be working on it. You both better be meeting halfway. You can't just stand back and wait for her to do her thing. You can't just say, well, if he gets his act together, then I'll, I'll be kind. No, you've got to do the work. Communities are difficult to maintain too. We've all got to pitch in. And very often we say, oh, we've all got to help the community. What we mean by that is we've got to go vote. Oh, that's cool. I, I guess that's good. You should do that. You know, where we say, well, I ought, to, I ought to post something online. That's less cool because I don't know who that actually helps. But it's not, you know, when we say get involved, we don't just mean like go and come to an event. It means what, what's your circle? What's your influence? Are you doing what you can to bring Christ into that? At your workplace, it, there might be a cost to letting people know that you believe in Christ. You're going to get troublesome questions from people that watch a lot of snarky YouTube videos. So let me ask you this. You're a Christian, right? You can always tell when it's coming. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. But are you going to shine the light or aren't you? Even in your own life, you can't lay back and expect God just to do things for you. James said, faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. He says, if you're the kind of guy that goes up to somebody and you see that they have a need and you say, oh, may the Lord bless you and you've got the need, you've got the, the ability to meet that need, he goes, that kind of faith won't save you. Paul was very doctrinal. James was very practical, wasn't he? Lord, bless me, bless me. It's like, well, what are you, are you doing anything? Are you pay, taking up your cross? Are you denying yourself? Are you giving things up to follow me? Lord, cleanse me of this sin. Okay, all right, I need you to stop watching TV. You stop listening to that band because it, it puts you in the wrong mindset. Oh God, you wouldn't ask that of me. Well, listen, there's a cost to be paid and you've got to be willing to step up and do the work. So ask yourself, are you unwilling to contribute to do what it takes to be ready for the Lord. If you will not do what it takes to be ready for the Lord, you won't be. If you say, well, I'll wait for the revival and, and then I'll, I'll jump in. You'll probably miss the revival if that's going to be your attitude. Haggai 1 verse 9, the prophet said to the people, you looked for much. And behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. It feels like my paycheck sometimes. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while well, each of you busies himself with his own house. 
He says, he says they were paneling their walls and making their houses look good. Like, it was past like building the walls and the ceiling. They were actually just beautifying it. And the temple was still in ruins. The Lord goes, I'm not going to bless you for that. It seems like the money's always gone. God's like, yeah, how about that? How about you pay attention to what's most important? Same thing for you and for me. Whether that's the church or your house or your community, you've got to step up and help pay the cost. You've got to be willing to sacrifice and sweat if you want to build a house where God can dwell continually. All right, this is the long one here. So everybody buckle in. We've got a couple chapters, but stay with me, okay? Chapter 36, verse 8, and we'll go down to the end of chapter 39. And all the craftsmen among the workmen made the tabernacle with ten curtains. They were made of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns with cherubim skillfully worked. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains to one another and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain of the first set. Likewise, he made them on the edge of the outermost curtain of the second set. He made 50 loops on the one curtain, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was in the second set. The loops were opposite one another. And he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the curtains one to the other with clasps, so the tabernacle was a single whole. He also made curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain, 4 cubits. Remember, a cubit was about 18 inches. The 11 curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And he made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain of the one set and 50 loops on the edge of the other connecting curtain. And he made 50 clasps of bronze to couple the tent together that it might be a single whole. And he made for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins. Then he made the upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits was the length of a frame and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. Each frame had two tenons for fitting together. He did this for all the frames of the tabernacle. The frames for the tabernacle he made thus, 20 frames for the south side, and he made 40 bases of silver under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, he made 20 frames, and there are 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame, and two bases under the next frame. For the rear of the tabernacle westward, he made six frames. He made two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they were separate beneath but joined at the top at the first ring. He made two of them this way for the two corners. There were eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases under every frame, two bases. He made bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the frames of the tabernacle at the rear eastward. And he made the middle bar to run from end to end halfway up the frames. And he overlaid the frames with gold and made their rings of gold for holders for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. He made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen with cherubim skillfully worked into it, he made it. And for it he made four pillars of acacia and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold, and he cast for them four bases of silver. He also made a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework and its five pillars with their hooks. He overlaid their capitals, and their fillets were of gold, but their five bases were of bronze. So there you have the outer structure of the tabernacle. Now we're going to go inside. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half in height. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold. Remember, this is the lid of the ark. Two cubits and a half was its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And he made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work on the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, he made the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces to one another, toward the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. He also made the table of acacia wood. 
Two cubits was its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. And he made a rim around it a handbreadth wide and made a molding of gold around the rim. He cast for it four rings of gold and fastened the rings to the four corners at its legs. Close to the frame were the rings as holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table, its plates and dishes for incense and its bowls and flagons with which to pour drink offerings. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers were of one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out on one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out on the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their calyxes and their hammered work of pure gold. I'm sorry. Their calyxes and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. And he made it seven lamps and its tongs and its trays of pure gold. He made it and all its utensils out of a talent of pure gold. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit, its breadth was a cubit. It was a square, and two cubits was its height. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and around its side and its horns. And he made a molding of gold around it, and made two rings of gold on it under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil also, and the pure fragrant incense blended as by the perfumer. So we were just in the holy of holies, then we were in the holy place, now we're going outside. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length, and five cubits its breadth. It was square, and three cubits was its height. He made horns for it on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. And he made all the utensils of the altar the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the firepans. He made all its utensils of bronze, and he made for the altar a grating, a network of bronze under its ledge, extending halfway down. He cast four rings on the four corners of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. And he put the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it with them. He made it hollow with boards." He made the basin of bronze and its stand of bronze from the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he made the court. So we're done with the furnishings. Now we're doing the outer court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, there were hangings of a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 bases were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the west side were hangings of 50 cubits, their 10 pillars and their 10 bases. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver, and for the front to the east, 50 cubits. The hangings for, the one, for one side of the gate were 50 cubits with their three pillars and three bases, and so for the other side. On both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits, with their three pillars and their three bases. All the hangings around the court were of fine twined linen, and the bases for the pillars were of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. The overlaying of their capitals was also of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the screen for the gate of the court was embroidered with needlework in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It was 20 cubits long and five cubits high in its breadth, corresponding to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were four in number. The four bases were of bronze, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their capitals and their fillets of silver. And all the pegs for the tabernacle and for the court all around were of bronze. These are the records of the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony, as they were recorded at the commandment of Moses, the responsibility of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. 
It's a little note there. Ithamar is the one writing all this stuff down as Moses tells him to. Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. We mentioned that too, that it seems Bezalel was in charge of kind of the, the heavier work, the carvings and the, the metal, and Aholiab did more of the delicate work with the needlework and things like that. All the gold that was used for the work in all the construction of the sanctuary, the gold from the offering was 29 talents and 730 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary, which is a ton of gold. The silver from those of the congregation who were recorded was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. A bekah ahead, that is half a shekel by the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone who is listed in the records from 20 years old and upward for 603,550 men. Remember, they were to offer that, that silver. We talked about that earlier as, as a first donation. The hundred talents of silver were for casting the bases of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil, a hundred bases for the hundred talents, a talent a base. It's very heavy. So it's supposed to hold the, the outer court screens in place. And of the 1,775 1, shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their capitals and made fillets for them. The bronze that was offered was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. With it, he made the bases for the entrance of the tent of meeting, the bronze altar and the bronze grating for it, and all the utensils of the altar, the bases around the court and the bases of the gate of the court, all the pegs of the tabernacle and all the pegs around the court. So hopefully you've more or less got a picture of what was just built here. We're moving on to what the priests are going to wear and the things that are used inside. From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. And they hammered out gold leaf and he cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and the scarlet yarns and into the fine twined linen in skilled design. They made for the ephod attaching shoulder pieces joined to it at its two edges and the skillfully woven band on it was of one piece with it and made like it of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold filigree and engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel. And he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the breast piece in skilled work in the style of the ephod, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. It was square. They made the breast piece doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth when doubled. And they set in it four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. There were 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. And they made on the breast piece twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two edges of the breast piece. And they put the two cords of gold in the two rings at the edges of the breast piece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree. Thus they attached it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breast piece on the inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attached them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod and that the breast piece should not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also made the robe of the ephod woven all of blue and the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the robe between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, 
a bell, and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe for ministering as the Lord had commanded Moses. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the caps of fine linen, and the linen undergarments of fine twined linen, and the sash of fine twined linen, and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, embroidered with needlework as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, Holy to the Lord." And they tied to it a cord of blue to fasten it on the turban above, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases the covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps with the lamp set and all its utensils and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, And behold, they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, so had they done it. Then Moses blessed them. I hope you were able to follow that and and get a sense of what was being built here and what it looked like. And and if not, we've gone into great detail in the previous chapters, our previous studies of what each piece would have been like. And I encourage you to go back and take a second listen and, and hope to get kind of a visual picture in your mind. There's a long, long description, and it essentially doubles everything that we've read in Exodus 25 through 31. He pretty much says it again, except this time he just says they made it. And, and as slow and as, as maybe even tedious as it may be to read, remember, this is incredible what they're doing. They're building a place where God will be, where he will dwell among his people, according, remember, to his exact specifications, which were heavenly ones. Moses was told, everything that you see, I want you to write down and make it like that. Despite all the corruption of the people, despite the golden calf, we get the chance to see them have God in their midst. Hebrews 8.5 says, when Moses was about to erect the tent, that is the tabernacle, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And the point of this passage is they did that exactly the way the Lord had told them. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but in verses 42 and 43, there's a very close parallel to what it says the Lord did in Genesis 1 and 2. When it says that Moses saw all that they had done, that they had done it just the way the Lord had said, and that he then blessed them. In the same way in Genesis, it says God saw all that he had made, that it was what? Good. And he blessed it, and he blessed the Sabbath day, the rest. Here's our third lesson. To build a house for God, it must be in the right style. That is to say, it must be done according to God's design, not yours. And certainly not somebody else's. The tabernacle was to be a picture of so many things. And we went into this in detail that the the layers of symbolism that the tabernacle held. It was a symbol of creation. It was a symbol of the exodus. It was a symbol of the encounter they had had at Mount Sinai. It represented the Garden of Eden. It was a picture of God's throne as would be revealed to Moses and Ezekiel and John. So knowing that, how could they mess with the design for their own preferences. You know, Moses, we've got an awful lot of green twined linen that might work. God said blue. I know, but I just, I've always liked green. God said this way. You know, it would be a lot more cost effective if we did bronze instead of gold, Moses. God said gold. It's God's design. In the same way, you can work righteously. 
and work hard. But you better be building after God's design. So the first thing we saw, you better be doing it according to God's commandments. You better be walking in holiness. And you better be willing to do the work and, and shoulder the burden. But if you're trying to build something that God did not ask you to build, or build something after a design that is not the way God designed it, the, the Spirit of God is not going to fill that and bless that. In the church, God has designs for us to follow. The Lord has set up authority in his church. And it doesn't matter how many hippies decide we're going to have church and we're not going to have any authority or anything. The Bible says the Lord set up pastors, teachers, elders. Sometimes they use the word bishop, which we're not, you know, we don't use, but we can function that way as well. He set that up in the church. He said that the men are to teach and not the women. That's a design that God has given his church. He says that we are to contribute together for the, the common good. That we're to not forbid speaking in tongues. That we're not to despise prophecies. That we're to be Bereans and check everything against the word of God. That we place a premium on teaching the word. That we pray that it's one of the things that defines us as people and that we love one another. If you're building a church that doesn't match up with some of that, don't wonder at the fact that God's not blessing it. Or if he is blessing it, that it seems to be carnal and have nothing to do with God, but just a whole lot to do with you. We've got to do it according to God's design. In the family, each person has a divine part to play. We've already touched on this. Children are to obey their parents. They're not to be, you know, sometimes kids treat their parents like employees or servants. And it's kind of people let their kids walk all over them. Well, I'm just trying to empower them. And the Bible doesn't say a lot about that. It has an awful lot to say about disciplining your children, though. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That a man shall cling to his wife, that is, his only wife. Leaders in the church especially are specifically to be men of one woman. Wives, submit unto your husband as unto Christ. If you're not doing that, don't expect God to bless what's going on in the house. I, I don't even need to get into all manner of sexual perversion that has come in. When you're going to say, we're going to build a house with two husbands instead of a wife and a husband, or two women, or we're going to allow our children to change their gender or things like that. God's not going to bless that. That's not God's design. In the same way, for a community, you've got to look to God's truth, not your own ideas. We have a hard time with this as Americans because we really like our ideas. And, and, and they're good ideas as far as they go and as far as they align with the Lord's word. But we've got to know that there is a higher law and there are higher principles and higher things that we need to be looking to. And that when, the more you deviate from that, the less God is going to fill these things. This is the case not just with us, but with every nation and every empire and kingdom that's ever existed. The Lord goes, I'm not going to fill this with my presence. And it's, the, it's the tragedy of Babylon, where Belshazzar was told, Babylon has been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Wanting what? Any acknowledgement of God, any sense of worship and holiness. They were, they were celebrating the gods of gold and silver with the special cups that we just read about that were to be used in the tabernacle and the temple. You've got to build it after God's design. And your own life. Are you trying to do a bunch of stuff that you know that's not how God wants you to be? I, I've tried church and it's not working for me. Well, are you submitting to the ancient creeds and doctrines of the church? Or are you trying to have this salad bar kind of religion? <laughs> Make your own thing. Are you trying to say, I know what God says about sex, but this is what I want to do. Bless me, Lord. Don't count on it. God's design. Mess with God's design or his order, and it does not matter how pious you look or how diligent you are. If you're not doing it God's way, don't expect God's presence to fill it. Jeremiah 6.16. 6, I read this this morning in my devotions. I had to share it. It's just such a good verse. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And I'm sorry to say there are so many that are saying we will not walk in it. Can I be a Christian and? No, then I'd rather not be a Christian. Isn't that a horrible thing, a horrible decision we make? Rather than saying, can I be a Christian and? No, then this thing goes on the altar. We say, well, then I'm going to find something else. We can say, well, we've, we value families, but if families looks nothing like the way God created it and designed it, don't expect God to bless that. We can't stand shoulder to shoulder with people that are going to violate God's designs and act like everything's okay. We can't look at churches that are going to empower things and empower people that God never intended to be there 
and expect his blessing to come. Learn from God and do it his way, according to his design, not just according to his commandments and not just doing the work because it's important, but doing it, building something that God has ordained. Last chapter here, chapter 40, and then we'll be done. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. That would be the first day of the first month of the year, of course. And you shall put in it the ark of the testimony. And you shall screen the ark with a veil. Probably a real heavy moment, huh? Putting the veil in front of the ark of the covenant. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it. You shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. And you shall put up the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. We're working outward. Hopefully you're tracking here. And place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. And you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. Do you remember the... the oil and the perfume design that we read before that was not to be replicated. That's the oil that we're talking about. Verse 10, you shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and you shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, second year that would be since they've left Egypt, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark. The testimony would be the two tablets that he had made with the commandments on them. And put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. So as you walk into the tabernacle on your right side would have been the table of showbread. On the left would have been the golden lampstand. Directly ahead of you in front of the veil would have been the golden altar of incense. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle, verse 29, and he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses, the first of many. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Interesting that he took such a personal hand in assembling this thing. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So another long description of the assembly and of the dedication. We read those uh, sections in great detail in previous chapters. The Lord let him know exactly what was to be done, the blood on the ear and the finger and the toe, if you remember that. 
And finally, we have the glory of the Lord filling the house that they had built for him. And this is how the book of Exodus ends. This has been where we've been building to all this whole book long. It's been, well, it's the first month of the second year since they've left. The glory of the Lord filled the house. We see this two more times in the Bible. The first is when they, or the second, I guess, is when they uh, built the temple. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it said, When the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Very similar, right? In fact, identical. That that pillar of cloud that they'd followed moved into the tabernacle, and then later into the temple, to the point where, like, we can't even go in there. We can't even see where we're going. And the last time is in Acts chapter 2. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they now, remember we as Christians are the house of the Lord, and the Spirit came and filled them for the first time. When the people obeyed the Lord and worked in holiness, God blessed them with his presence. So here's our fourth and final lesson. The house that you're building becomes the right space when and only when God fills it. There's nothing special about a tabernacle, even a golden one, or a temple, or a church, unless God is there. Solomon acknowledged that in 1 Kings 8, 27. He said, Heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this little, little house I built. Now Israel would forget this and need to be reminded by Stephen later in Acts chapter 7. But the point is, it's just a house. It's just a building. They would corrupt it and leave it derelict and, and fall into disrepair several times. Now granted, in there they would worship and they would pray and they would encounter God there. But it was God who made it holy. Amen? Amen? It was not the fact that they made it really pretty and really special. God made this place holy. People do not sanctify a space. God does. It was his presence that they were after. And they would encounter him also outside the tabernacle, outside the temple. Because God is not bound to any walls, even ones that he mandated be built. If you prepare your house for God, then he will fill it. And then and only then will it be his house. In church, we wait upon God's presence. That's what that week of prayer was all about. Taking the time to stop, slow down, and make sure that we are submitting to the presence of God and waiting upon him. This is why we pray before services start. This is why we take the time to worship and sing. And sometimes we allow the singing to continue for a time because we're like, the Lord is here. We're waiting on him. You can't just come in and do church. You know, we, do, we work very hard to make sure we start and end on time. But if the Spirit were to come in and have His way, we're going to continue. <laughs> because this is God's house. If you want your house to be a place where God can dwell, you've got to take the time to make it God's house. You've got to dedicate time in that house and energy in that house to Him. There's a reason we call it devotion. I'm devoting this time to you. I'm devoting this energy to you. This week, we're not going to participate in secular activities so that we can wait upon you. We're devoting ourselves to the Lord. You can't just say, okay, I've got, you know, we're not, we're not committing major sin. We're all working hard together and we're doing it the way that God designed it. Okay, but is God there? Are you taking the time to invite God into your family? Consciously, actively, are you teaching your children to do it? Are you doing it together as a husband and wife? Communities cannot rely on religious tradition for God to always be there, can they? You know, Scotland, which is where the revival of the Reformation went in, in great power, have been great preachers that have come out of there, John Knox and other great reformers. Scotland is now classified as an unreached people group, like some of those African countries or the tribes of Nepal. Scotland. Oh, they have such a great religious heritage. Yes, but so what? If God is not there now, it is no longer the house of the Lord. Even as Samson rose to fight the Philistines and did not realize that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And he was as weak as any other man. It doesn't matter how many great sermons are preached in this room. 
we stop calling upon the Lord, it'll just be a room. Great churches and cathedrals in Europe and other places are being given over to become mosques. Well, God did great things here, but God's not there anymore because we stopped calling upon him. Even you yourself must cleanse yourself and take time to wait upon him, dedicate and devote yourself to him. You can't just do all the right things and say, therefore, God must. No, you've got to take the time to wait on God because he's not the force. He's a person. You've got to get to know him and talk to him and listen to him and invite him into your life. And listen, he will come. Isn't that wonderful? He will fill your life. The Bible tells us, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continuative imperative, meaning not just once, but continue to be filled with the Spirit. Call upon the Lord to fill your life. Take the time to say, I invite you, God, into this day. You feel yourself beginning to be tempted or to have bad thoughts and bad attitudes. Just say, Lord, I invite you into this moment. It's yours. You've got to be constantly stepping back, taking a knee, and deferring to the one whose presence you want to dwell with you. Far too easy to have a good show and a nice appearance, and you have none of God. Far too easy to have a proper service with sound doctrine and good worship and, and good friends, but none of Jesus. I hope that we will always be taking the time to give the Lord free reign in this place. And in fact, that is the goal. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus says this. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, that means anyone, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. That means that God desires to dwell with you. You're not having to woo God to come down. He wants to be there. He is the one knocking on the door. Open the door by faith and receive his presence. Step aside and let the Lord begin to clean your house as he did this one. And that is the end of the book of Exodus. And you can see the major theme of the book of Exodus fulfilled in this last, this last chapter. That God was revealing himself to the world afresh. It began with Israel enslaved, calling upon the Lord for four centuries to deliver them. God then intervened with one man in the middle of the wilderness. And then he made war against Egypt and its gods. He was declaring war not just against Egypt and Pharaoh, but against these false usurping demons that called themselves gods. He made a great mockery of them. He drowned the army in the Red Sea. He revealed himself in the wilderness with a pillar of cloud and fire, providing bread and water and victory. He descended upon the mountain in a great theophany and cut a covenant with the people. And last we see him descending upon the sanctuary to be with them forever. No longer, from the beginning of Genesis till now, God is not going to allow evil to run rampant or unchallenged anymore. He has asserted his strength on the world stage by liberating Israel. It's God's way of saying, I'm still here, and I'm still God. This is my nation. I will take my nation against all of these other nations and their so-called gods, and I will win in the end. That is the hope of a true and living God who dwells with his people. That's been the hope of all time. Ever since we were driven out of the Garden of Eden, we've been drifting farther and farther from God, from the flood to the Tower of Babel. But book of Exodus is where God begins to bridge the gap, to show himself, to plant his foot on the earth and say, this is still mine. And we know this is just the beginning of the story. That gap was ultimately bridged, not by the old, but by the new covenant in Christ Jesus. He is the greater deliverer from a greater slave master. The greater law. He is a greater tabernacle, priest and sacrifice for us all. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, it's great to have God's cloud in the tabernacle, but what if you could have God walking in flesh right next to you? The word for become flesh can even be translate, translated to set up a tent or to build a tabernacle among us. He sent his Holy Spirit afterwards to dwell in us. And now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are that tabernacle that is being raised up. 
And until he returns, we are herald of this covenant that not only is God real, not only does he love us, but he desires to dwell with us. We are being built up into a new house for the Lord. And when he finally returns, then it will all be consummated. The end of the Bible, Revelation 21.3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is post-judgment, post-millennium. This is the new heavens and the new earth. And God said, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That is the ultimate goal of all creation in history is for God to dwell with his people. It began in Exodus. It continued when Jesus was incarnate. It continues today as his Holy Spirit dwells among us. We are looking forward to the day when it will be all fulfilled. We live in the foretaste of glory divine. And so we look to the example of Exodus with the right spirit, obeying his commandments, with the right stuff, understanding there's a cost and being willing to pay it in the right style, his design, not mine. And then you can build the right space and it only becomes that when God fills it. And when he does, you need not wait until the end of time to say in truth, the dwelling place of God is with man.